Hello everyone, my name is Colin, and as you can see by the mat here, you can see that I got top 32. I got 18th place, just missed it by by a couple tiebreakers, so it's kind of annoying. It's not really one to focus in on Janimba. But yeah, anyway, I'm just going to be going over how the deck works, because it works a little differently than the typical Janimba deck. Now the whole thing's out of focus. Come on, get back in. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, anyway give you a brief summary of how my matches went, just to give you an idea of how the deck works. The first match I played against a Janemba Mirror, and it was kind of like a defensive deck. So that one, I 2-0'd that matchup, just because the they had a big reliance on the pseudo combos, the super combos, like the, what do you call them, the Super Saiyan, Sun Goku, the Cell, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of Mafubas, a lot of Negates, and this kind of deck just goes right over that. And he got some early Mafubas in, which actually worked in my favor because the Childish would come off and then I'd be able to just aggro from there. So yeah, that matchup went pretty smoothly. And then the second matchup was against Brawly, who was able to get Height of Mastery on me twice. But again, with the deck, it's more of a reliance on aggro, but it still has enough defense options. So both times that Height of Mastery came out, I survived both times. The first one he had three attacks on, and I was able to take no damage off those just because of the way I spaced out the negates and combos and stuff like that. So it can still be defensive when it needs to. And then in round two against the Brawly guy, I went 2-0 in that one as well. Round three was my easiest matchup against Shinron Gogeta, which doesn't really need to be explained that far on how you do that. Just show you the quick strategy here. You play one of these, and then you do... Where is he at? I passed by him. And one of these. And pretty much you just auto win the game. All you need to do is just use Pan to put yourself to 7 life. When they do the triple attack on Gogeta, you have ready stance on board. They do the first swing, you take it, go down to 4 life. They swing again, you block with ready stance. They swing, or on the second swing, when you block with ready stance, you awaken your leader. And then you just let ready stance die. Then they swing a third time, you drop a blue card, negate the attack. So on their big end of game swing you're able to take only three damage off that whole encounter and then after that their leader is at 10k with no abilities so it's just easy to win from there and then my fourth round was against another brawly deck the same thing kind of happened where it was a little more difficult this time around i got the high roll on game one and then i was able to take that one and then game two i lost because he had just too much aggro too quickly and because of how long the second game took we actually went into time so I got kind of lucky there that I was able to kill him quickly because actually out of the 10 wins that I had during the whole tournament, only three of them were due to milling out the opponent. So a majority of my victories just came from taking their life from 8 to 0. And this one was one of those times where we went to 0, 1, 2, 3. It came back to my turn on turn 3 and I was able to kill him on turn 3. I actually had to end up playing Unyielding Trunks as a battle card and then attacking his leader, no negates, and then I went up to 45,000 double strike. And I was able to pull that game around. Game five, I played against the famous Danny Hype. <laughs> and as you probably know by now, he was running the Yellow Dende deck, which just kind of destroys Janimba. But now I know how I've never play tested against it, so I had no idea what to expect. And I actually had King Yimas in my side deck the day prior to the event. And I ended up taking them out for objection, which I never ended up using. So that kind of sucked. I went 0-2 against Danny. And then you had the final round, round six, I played against another well-known player, Rishi. He runs r, r Gaming on TCG Player, if you ever see him on there. And against him, he was playing Baby. And round one, I actually made a huge misplay. I played the Demon Sword when he had the Great Ape on board. So the Demon Sword just died instantly. <laughs> so that did not work in my favor. So obviously, through game one there. And then game two came around, and I was able to deck him out on game two. Because the only deck outs I were able to get were... Uh, two deck outs on the Shenron player, and then one deck out on Rishi. And then game three came around, and it was mostly just due to just kind of spacing, where I Mifuba'd his four-drop baby Vegeta. Uh, two turns later, I was at five energy, so I was able to do a double childish play. And then I was able to warp his foreseeing hit and his baby at the same time. And that just swung favor back into my control. So that's basically how the matches went. I went 5-1 by the end of it. I got 18th place, which <laughs> just missed by two slots. So that was kind of, I mean, I still got the playmat, as you can see, it's a very nice playmat, <laughs> but it's it's definitely, I missed out on a couple big leader cards, which were very cool looking. And I did not realize how big they were. <laughs> I thought they were just the normal big leaders, but nope. But anyway, I'll go through the more specifics of the deck. Obvious choice here, Psyche Demon. 
I do run it at three because realistically all they are are searchers. So late game, you actually never want to see this card. Maybe if you want to pull off a childish play or something like that. But for the most part, these are just early game. And then you have Awakening Talent Pan, which is really good in this deck. Not just because it helps you counter aggro and go in on them, but it's good against hand control decks as well, because you're always getting the life back in your hand and you're getting pan back in your hand. So at worst case scenario, you can just drop her if you're playing as hand control. She just has a lot of utility. I main deck Cronoa specifically just for this meta, because I had a feeling I was going to play against Brawly a lot. And funny enough, in round two, the Brawly I played there, that was actually the only time I was able to pull off Cronoa. <laughs> in, in round four, when I was playing against Brawly, I actually, all three rounds, never once got Cronoa. So I was able to beat him just purely off just the rest of the deck without that card. And then, of course, you have your one use of Unyielding Spirit Trunks, which I was able to use to kill the Brawly player in round four. It was my final attack. I had, like, lead attack, and I had three battle cards, and this was the third battle card that I swung with. Because I had two on board already, but he negated both of those and comboed out of lead, I think it was. So that was very close to becoming a draw, but luckily he actually saved it for me. And this I actually used defensively a lot too. Against, uh, against Rishi in round five, I actually used this defensively to restand an energy so that I can bean on my next turn. So a lot of times I did use it offensively with Champa, but other times it was used just to make it easier for me to survive the next turn. And then of course Ready Stance. I actually used the three drop Piccolo instead in the team event. And I never really used it that much just because three is pretty expensive. And I had a feeling people would play cards that ignored barrier two or less, so I went ahead and removed this and I put it back in, which actually saved me in a lot of games. So I'm glad I put Ready Stance back in. The super combo, I just run four, the sparking one. I think it's better, it gives you more options for defense instead of having to force yourself down to four life. You can just do it earlier in the game if you wanted to. And I already have Dimension Magic, so it just made more sense to do double sparking. Champa, obviously, very important in the main deck. This actually caught a lot of people off guard in game one because usually Champa is a side deck card. So I was able to steal a lot of game ones just because they would get down to two life thinking they were safe. And then I would play one of my barrier cards like the three drop Vegeta that has 20k on offense. And then I would just go up to like 50,000 double. And even if they survived the attack, it would take so much out of their hand resource wise that they usually wouldn't survive much longer after that. And then three of the Gohans, because I didn't run into a single Black Mass Saiyan, so these were really cheap ways to just basically set up offense on the next turn. Since the deck is already aggressive anyway, it's a good way to defend and then come back with an offensive card. Because a lot of people, when I would play this card, they would actually turn their focus from my leader to Gohan, and I would still defend him anyway. So next turn, I would have two 15Ks bare minimum swinging. And then I had Vegeta, which actually was very rarely used as a defensive card. Because that new 3-drop Striving Vegeta actually really just dominates this card here. So I would always either, if I'm playing against Yellow, sometimes I just leave him inactive and then swing when I need to so that they would self-awaken me. And then most of the times I was just using this to go for kill. Because I got, I think, two of my double strike wins off of this Vegeta just because it's really hard to do anything to. You can't after image it and you can't use a Revenge Death Ball on it. So basically if you don't have it in the gate, he's just going to stay there. And even if you use Explosive with Shugesh, if I hadn't Kronoid you, then it wouldn't work unless you had the Striving Vegeta to be able to KO him. And then you of course have Childish Janimba, which I run at 4 for obvious reasons, because he's probably the most useful Janimba in the deck. A lot of times people will just play it and leave it there, but typically whenever I play Childish Janimba, I usually do it on a turn that I'm going to be activating its ability. So I'll just play it, swing, and then bring out the other Janimba and then swing with that one too, and then trigger their ability which helps you, I actually got a few games just swinging with this one here, which a lot of people probably weren't expecting. They were probably expecting me to go up the chain, and instead I just comboed hard on this one. And then you have Demon Sword, which I also run it for. And some people I heard actually run not a single Childish or Psyche Demon, which I think is just insane. You need, you need at least three of either of those. And then of course Demon Sword at 4, just because I did run it at 3 very shortly in my local scene, and then I could just never find it when I needed it. They would all either be in my life, or they'd be in my hand, or they'd be in my energy because I got them turn 1. So it was not very great running it at 3. And then of course Reality Bender at 4 as well, just because they are very vital whenever you get that ability to play 2 in one turn. Which is actually how I beat Rishi in game two, because I was actually, he was at seven cards in deck, so I was able to do Lead Swing, Reality Bender, and Demon Sword all in the same turn. So yeah, very important to be able to do that. 
And these are actually the only of the pseudo super combos I run, just three of these, because a lot of people like to stuff their deck with these, like have eight each, or not eight each, just eight in total, four each of the Goku and the Cell. But I feel like it bogs down the deck a lot, and it takes away a lot of your options. Like, yeah, it'll let you survive longer, but a lot of these matches, you don't want to be surviving longer. You want to be ending the game early. So I feel like three of those is safe. I might cut down to two during set six, because I'm going to make some pretty big changes to this deck. And then you have your one Zeno button, which actually a lot of people weren't expecting this. And if you played anything that doesn't have Bad Ring Laser, this saved me so many games, just being able to keep my energy on next turn to combo out, use Mafuba, whatever I needed to do. So very good card to run at one, especially in the main deck. And then of course you have your obligatory Sensu Bean, <laughs> very important. I rarely use this on offense unless I'm running against a deck that I want to be able to be safe on next turn. So instead of tapping myself out, I'll just play a three drop card when I'm at four energy and then just use one of these to restand one of those energy and then add some more pressure on offense. But 75% of the time I'm using this only for defense. Then of course you have Dimension Magic, which is obviously run at four. It is a sparking negate, and the negate itself is just so good. It's just Sensu Bean without a buff. <laughs> so very good. I actually, in the first Brawly guy I played against, the turn prior he was about to hit four energy, because he was on three energy and then he played Path to Greatness. So what I did is I had one card in drop. So I just swung with one of my barrier cards, and he said no negates. So I threw down a Sensu Bean, a Champa, I think a Cell, and then a Super Combo, just to put four more cards in my drop area. And next turn, he, he comboed out of the damage. So I actually, I got resources off that, which was good. And then next turn, he did the Height of Mastery play, obviously. He swung with Height of Mastery, and I did a Sparking Negate, which he bad ringed, but I was still able to take a card out of life, which I think was a Super Combo and I was able to combo out of the first attack, and then the next attack I'd use Dimension Magic again because I had two in hand, and there was no bad ring on that, and then his third swing I did the leader negate. So I was able to block all the damage, and then the very next turn I went in for the kill. Which you can't really do that well with this main deck, I'll show you what I used mostly in the side deck. And then two Mafuba in the main deck as well, came very much so in handy in the baby matchup and then the Janimba matchup as well. And especially in the Brawly Storm matchup where they have the Ape Bardock, it's good to use it on that just because next turn you get free attacks on them. So now let's go over to the side deck. Yeah, put those there. Oop. There we go. Then over here, you have your Dende. I actually have a friend in my local scene who said Shinron was going to be dead and no one was going to use it. So try not to focus on the Shinron matchup. And then, of course, round three, I play Shinron Gogeta. So <laughs> Dende is a very obvious choice. I sided that in, and it just made my game two so much easier. Because game one, I didn't have Dende, but I still won. But it just makes the matchup so much easier to be able to block off a lot of damage. And then, of course, you have Kami for any kind of veggies or Pan or Baby or anything that floods the board. Which, actually, in my match against Pan in the team event, I did use this to wipe the board. And then in the singles event, playing against Danny, I actually sided in Kami because in our first match, he played four battle cards on the field, and this would have come very much so in handy in that match. But I wasn't able to use it, obviously. And then game two, he never had four in his battle area, so it was just kind of pointless at that point. I did side it in, though. And then this is probably my most disappointing side deck item, just because the idea behind it was against Brawly, it helps you get an extra energy so that Height of Mastery can't full tap you, which is good on its own. And then against Shinron... I would be able to jump myself up in energy so I can start Janimbaing faster. And then if the Shinron player wants to use Dende to snipe my energy, it doesn't really matter for me because I want the game to go longer just so I can mill you out. And against Shinron, that's not that long because they're already using the Dragon Balls to mill themselves. But what was originally in this slot was King Yima, which takes two battle cards from your opponent's drop area and sends them to the bottom of their deck. So if those were still in my side deck during my match with Danny, I could have very at least just taken his Frieza's and put him back under his deck so that he couldn't use Revival of the Emperor to take them back. So from now on, when I have a hunch of what card would be good in the meta, I'm just going to stick with that because that could have been the difference between going 5-1 and going 6-0 if I were to win that match. And even if I didn't win the round 6, just winning in round 5 against Annie, my tiebreakers would have been incredible at that point. So even if I did go 5-1 by the end of it, that would be a great tiebreaker to have. So that tiebreaker alone probably is what kept me out of top 16 and got me 18th instead. This one was a last minute change because I had the four drop Shinron in its place 
And I actually did side this in against Rishi, but that was the only one that I was going to use it on. I sided this in because I was going to use a triple strike on him, but I never got around to it. I was able to end the game before having to use at all costs, but it still would have been handy in that matchup. And then of course you have for the Brawly matchup, striving to be the best, which is a very good defensive tool. And I did end up using this in my Brawly matchups, so that did help out. It, I wasn't using it as much, but the card that got the most use out of my side deck was this one here, Preface of Recovery, which honestly probably should have been in the main deck because of how much I was using it. I was actually, I used it so many times that I think at the end of every, I think at the end of every game one, I think I sided in Preface of Recovery. So that just goes to show you how often I was using that card. But yeah, that was one of the main ways that I would finish the game, is I would play Preface, and then I would be able to have extra energy to play other battle cards. Or even just on its own, I would play Preface, Restand 2 Energy, I would swing with Preface, and now I have energy to do a Champa and a Cell at the same time. So already he's getting his own value back. And it just helps a lot paired with other cards like Trunks to Restand that extra energy, and with all the 10Ks I run, it just... Even if on defense you play Preface and Pass Turn, you're still open with 2 Energy. So you're able to establish board presence, and again, also against Rishi, I sided it in because he's running Baby, and Baby has almost no way to interact with Barrier. So I would have all these Preface and Janimbas all in rest mode, and you either dedicate swings to it to try to get it off the board, or you just ignore it and go for leader. And realistically, either one of those situations kind of works for me, because I know there's no effect that you can use to pop them off the field. So it just made a lot of my plays safer running all this barrier. But yeah, anyway, that's about all there is to say about this deck. Uh, I'm probably going to end up running it into set 6 as well, just because the new Agents of Destruction and there's new cards like God Strike that would really help this deck out. So I'm probably going to continue running it. I might run the Red Gogeta BR as well, or the Frieza BR, because both of those decks look really good. So I'm either going to stick with Janemba, or I'm going to go to Red. I guess it depends on how much TN nerfs this deck. So we'll see.